Hi everyone. In this Connect with Networking video, we're going to be discussing Chapter 10, the Internet. Let's go ahead and get started. In the past, we would often hear people interchangeably use the term Internet and World Wide Web, but in this class, we are certainly going to differentiate between these two. The World Wide Web is all about hyperlinked content, so web pages, but what we're going to be talking about in this chapter is how we're transporting both World Wide Web traffic and other types of traffic across the publicly available internet network. There are various internet service providers around the world that connect private networks to one another and connect their customers to the internet at large. And internet service providers have varied in size historically. We tend to think about them in terms of tiers. An internet service provider that is national would be a tier one internet service provider. ISPs that are more regional would be tier two, and a local internet service provider would be tier three. Now, because of consolidation, we don't see this clear delineation as much anymore in the US, but there are still some regional ISPs and some local ISPs that operate much like they did a few years ago. Historically, the smaller regional internet service providers would have to purchase connections to the higher tier national internet service providers. And these interconnections would happen at what are called internet exchange points, abbreviated IXP. So here's a picture of what the traditional internet architecture may have looked like back when we had a lot of variation in terms of tiers. You can see that most of the tier threes are connecting to tier twos. Tier twos might be communicating to each other through internet exchange points. Tier twos might also be communicating directly with tier ones. And tier ones might also be communicating with each other through internet exchange points. But if you look at this picture carefully, you can see there are lots of exceptions to the rule. There are some places where tier threes are connecting directly to an internet exchange point or where tier threes are connecting directly to other higher level tiers. So this is not meant to be a strict hierarchy. Internet service providers are autonomous systems and they share routing information between each other using the border gateway protocol, which we discussed in an earlier chapter. That's a protocol that limits the number of choices available for traffic to move from location to location. The higher tier internet service providers typically charge lower tier ISPs for data transfer. It's one of the ways that they make money. If you are an internet service provider that is at the same level as another internet service provider and you want to share traffic back and forth, we would typically see no charge for these two services to interchange information. And this is called peering. If an internet service provider doesn't charge its neighbor and they just agree to share traffic back and forth, they avoid this peering charge because they're peers with one another. But if you're not a peer with someone, if you're dealing with traffic at a higher level, you may have to pay a fee. It's difficult to get exact diagrams of backbone networks for major internet service providers. For one reason, they are changing fairly regularly, and for another, they often don't publicize exactly where their backbone is located for security purposes. But here's a diagram of what a backbone might look like. So you can see in this case, there are some major network nodes all across the country and even in Canada. A different internet backbone service provider would have different nodes in different locations and multiple ISPs would share information back and forth in order to reach all of the various places throughout the country. The largest ISP backbone networks are operating at at least 10 gigabits per second along a single channel and many of them are using 40 gigabits per second or higher, even 160 gigabits per second. And do keep in mind, this slide was first published back in 2015, so you would expect even faster speeds in 2020. But like I said, getting up-to-date statistics on this sort of information is definitely difficult. When a business or individual is trying to connect to an internet service provider, they're doing so through a point of presence, abbreviated POP. This is how you're connecting. And we're doing so through some sort of specific hardware, which is translating your local network traffic to the appropriate protocol for your internet service provider. The POP location is also where authentication takes place so that you have to prove that you are a customer for that internet service provider and you're allowed to use their services. 
In the US, we have seen the use of three major types of guided media, DSL, cable, and fiber to the home. And we have seen some use of wireless for internet service provider connections as well. Let's talk about each of these. DSL stands for Digital Subscriber Line. And this is a family of point-to-point -point technologies that phone companies have been offering for decades. It uses the same physical media as your traditional telephone wires. So it's the same copper wires that you use for your phones in your house, but they're broadcasting at a much higher frequency than what you would use for your voice communications, which allows for both the voice and the data communications to flow on the exact same piece of equipment and the exact same wires. On your customer premises, you'd have some equipment that include a DSL modem and a line splitter that would separate the voice communications and the data communications once they reach the customer's location. The local loop, often called the last mile, is the circuit that is closest to the customer and it connects the customer to the ISP's office. In the digital subscriber line situation, this is a point-to-point -point technology. So every individual customer has a direct connection to the main distribution facility. That does mean that it is a very secure connection, but there is an issue with attenuation. If you live in the back of your neighborhood, you might actually have much slower DSL speeds than somebody that's at the front of your neighborhood and is closer to the MDF. Here's a diagram of what we're talking about. You can see inside the customer premises, there is a line splitter to separate the voice communications from the data communications. The data communications would be received by a DSL modem, which would translate from the phone company's architecture and protocols to your local network's protocols, likely TCP IP. And then a router slash switch would move the traffic from your ISP into your network and then distribute to the appropriate devices within your network. Every individual customer premises has a local loop connection from their line splitter to the main distribution frame at your local carriers and office. From that main distribution frame, traffic would be directed to the telephone network if it's voice communication or to a DSL multiplexer if it's data communications. And then your local ISP would transmit your data using whatever protocols they're using internally. In this picture, they're using an asynchronous transfer mode protocol using a switch, but they might be using TCP IP and Ethernet. They might be using frame relay. They might be using some other protocol. Most digital subscriber lines pursue an asymmetric model where they have three different channels. The narrowest channel would be for voice, which doesn't require much bandwidth. The largest channel would be downstream because most consumers and businesses are interested in consuming more data than they are distributing. And then you'd have an upstream channel dedicated towards sending information. Now, obviously, some organizations would be more interested in the upstream than the downstream. So it's certainly possible to negotiate these various bandwidths as necessary with your ISP. There's also something called very high data rate DSL which gives you much higher data rates, but the range is much shorter because of the higher frequencies. And sometimes this is paired with fiber optics that are closer to the customer premises to translate the slower signals you're receiving on copper wires to a faster fiber optic network. A common and popular alternative to DSL would be cable. Cable is being used by most television companies, and it is often a hybrid of the traditional copper wire used for your television in your home to a fiber cable that starts at the end of your neighborhood and broadcasts the data throughout the cable company's network. Unlike DSL, cable networks are multi-point or shared networks. The cable from your house connects to a T-junction that connects to a cable that connects to all the different houses in your neighborhood. So your signal is intermingling with other signals throughout your neighborhood. That does mean that there is an issue with security because your traffic is intermingling with other people's traffic. And there's an issue with shared bandwidth. So if you are trying to use the cable modem during peak hours, you might not see as much available bandwidth as you would during the middle of the night because your neighbors are using their network as well. 
So there is a bandwidth issue and there's potentially a security issue with the cable model. The protocol that cable companies use is called Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification or DOCSIS. Current standard as of fall 2020 is DOCSIS 3.1 and that allows speeds up to a gigabit per second. Here in College Station, Suddenlink allows for the appropriate equipment on their DOCSIS standard to broadcast at gigabits per second speed in individual homes. And so some of you might take advantage of that. The cable modem that you use on the customer premises is often leased by the internet service provider, but certainly you can own your own as well. And they are configured to cap the bandwidth at a maximum rate but not necessarily limit the minimum rate. So you're gonna get at most a gigabit per second, for instance, but you might get a lot less than that. The diagram for a cable modem architecture is quite a bit different than the fiber optic because you need a line splitter on the customer premises to receive either television signals or data signals, and then a cable modem to direct the traffic and translate the traffic into the local area network. But on the way back into the cable company, you're only going to be receiving one type of information, and that's going to be data only. From your home to the cable company, you're not sending any television signals. So on the way back, all you're receiving is the upstream data, which is going to be directed specifically to the cable modem termination system. So you can see a splitter there at the optical electrical converter in the middle of the diagram, which only sends upstream signals to a specific location. But inside the cable company's distribution hub they have to have a combiner for the downstream to blend both your tv data and your network data for reception so a slightly different model than what we saw with dsl a third alternative to cable or dsl would be fiber optic to the home this has not been widely rolled out in the u.s yet though there has been talk for the last 15 years of this being a common alternative at some point in the future because the protocols available from both the phone company and the television company allow for bandwidth that most people find acceptable things like gigabit per second speeds over your cable modem i'm not sure when fiber optic to the home will become truly commonplace most modern neighborhoods are adopting fiber optic to the home but we're still seeing some rollout of traditional copper wires for networking as well. So who knows when this will actually be widely adopted. In some cases, a guided media solution is not gonna be practical. If you live way out in the country someplace or you live up in the mountains, uh, stringing cable to a specific location may not be feasible. So an alternative might be pursuing wireless. And the current modern standard for a wireless network would be some version of LTE or LTE advanced. And certainly at some point I will be talking about 5G in this class, but in fall of 2020, we're not quite ready to talk about it. It has been slowly rolled out in this country, but it is very, very new and not necessarily that robust at this point. So I won't be discussing it in this particular video, though I may have to add an amendment at some point to add to future lectures. Another possible alternative is the use of satellite. Again, this has traditionally been used by very remote locations. The biggest issue is that it has very high latency. It takes a long time for the signal to get from place to place and relatively low data rates. So using satellite is not a great idea for people that are trying to use the internet. Some things to know about the internet at large. There is some internet governance, but there is no single organization that actually governs the internet. It is a loose association of a variety of different organizations and societies. The Internet Society collects some of these together. So we see things like the Architecture Board and the Engineering Task Force and an Engineering Steering Group that all have a common interest in making sure the Internet continues to function and allow communication across the country and around the world. There's also an internet corporation for assigned names and numbers that's responsible for giving out IP addresses. And we discussed earlier in the semester how IPv4 addresses have been completely assigned, but IPv6 addresses are still being assigned to various organizations and countries, and so they are still responsible for that. There also is a governance forum and an international telecommunication union that play a role in how the internet is governed.
One of the biggest issues that the internet has faced in recent years is the idea of net neutrality. Historically, the internet has been viewed as net neutral, where anyone is allowed to use the internet and receive equal access to bandwidth and content. But recently, we're seeing a push for internet service providers to be allowed to regulate or discriminate certain types of data that run on their networks. So one particular internet service provider could decide to give advantageous bandwidth to Netflix over Hulu or to HBO Max over NBC Peacock. And there's nothing that you as a consumer could necessarily do about that. So that's definitely something that we as uh, citizens in this country should be concerned with. You should get informed about net neutrality and you should use your power as a U.S. citizen to vote your conscience in terms of how you feel about this. While the internet has continued to evolve and improve over time, its original purpose was to provide connectivity for government and educational facilities. And that obviously has not been the case for a long time now. So there is something called Internet 2, which the National Science Foundation started way back in 1996, which is trying to create a second version of the internet to satisfy that initial purpose of connecting educational and government research institutes to each other so that they can conduct their various research projects. And here's a picture of what Internet 2 has looked like as recently as 2015. And you can see there are a variety of different nodes all over the country that allow for various connectivity. There are a couple different nodes down towards Houston. You'll know one of those is blue and it says Advanced 3 Service. And that actually is here in College Station, Texas. Texas A&M is a major player in Internet 2. We are one of the largest research institutions in the world. So we have a major node on Internet 2 for conducting and sharing research results with other institutes around the country. Implications for management. We continue to see an increase in capacity for the Internet, so it is still a very viable way of moving information from place to place. And of course, more and more consumers are going to expect a presence of every organization on the Internet. We're seeing a continued increase in broadband data rates. Customers are expecting more content and more usage from their homes. So delivering that content on the Internet is going to be increasingly important for various businesses. And we are seeing a shift from the traditional guided media to wireless radiated media, especially in the mobile market, where more and more people are consuming their media and, and conducting their business using their mobile devices. So this has disrupted the internet service provider market quite a bit, and I would expect to see continued disruption moving forward, which does allow for some interesting opportunities for businesses that might be fast movers in this field. That's it for this chapter. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.